to the next episode of W Talks. I'm your host, Jean-Marc, WeWalk's R&D lead. As always, I'm joined by Kershat, WeWalk co-founder. Kershat, say hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new episode of W Talks series. Today, uh, we have joined by Chris Mears. Uh, he's a great engineer and angel investor. Uh, I believe he has really interesting stories and um, experiences to talk us, uh, to tell us. Uh, welcome, Chris. Thank you, um, and hello, everybody. Right, so uh, the basic introductory questions, as always, uh, tell us about yourself and what you do. Uh, so I was born in 1957, which I think uh the more uh, arithmetically uh, uh, brilliant amongst you will realize I'm now 63 I think um, I was born with a uh, this sorry my phone is just ringing here guys um, so um, I was born with vision impairment and I became registered blind when I was 18. I studied computer science at Cambridge when there was only enough material for a one-year course um, at Cambridge. Um, so that was in 1979 I graduated. Uh, and then um, shortly after that, I co-founded a business called Metaswitch Networks, which I spent most of my career at, and then uh, got involved in angel investing um, and mentoring technology startup businesses, which is now what I spend most of my time doing. Mm -hmm. Also, also, uh, as far as I know, you, you are blind from birth. Uh, could you tell us about your visual impairment, uh, how this has impacted your life? Oh, well, I, uh, I, I, my son, it was a degenerative condition. So when I was younger, I did used to ride a bike when I was a kid. It was a bit dangerous, but I could just about see enough to ride a bike. Um, and uh, even at university, I could still see enough using closed circuit television and um, sort of zo zooming enlargement technology. I could see enough to read um, books very slowly, uh, but now I'm completely blind now. So it's been a very slow degeneration. It's hard to say how it's affected my life. I mean, obviously it has been a big part of my life. Um, I don't know what, what sort of person I would be if I had not been blind. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I try not to let it uh, be the thing that I identifies me. Um, I, I am who I am, and I just happen to have this disability. So most of the time, I don't really think about it too much. Mm, I think that's it, there's an interesting parallel here, because from our previous guests, we've kind of seen a bit of a pattern. A lot of people that have, um, have a hereditary visual impairment condition that sort of has affected them since all their life, and you know, has, it's been a sort of a slow burn, a slow decrease they tend to sort of get used to it very quickly, or at least they, it never really becomes, you know, um, a turning point in their life because it's always existed. However, some of our guests who have kind of acquired their visual impairment um, sort of in their early years and their teenage years, I mean, Lucy Edwards is a really great example of that. You know, there, there is that sudden turning point. Um, and that's when you almost get two split personalities, people that have sort of let their visual impairment, you know, sort of fade to the background and have just gotten on with it. And people who have really been affected by it and where it's played a really big turning point in their life so i think it's interesting that you say that so yeah mm. just just an observation yeah yeah i mean i had um, all my siblings i had two brothers and two sisters and they all also have sight problems although not as significant as mine so it's just been been part of our lives really i guess mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for sure you just learn to deal with it um, and now speaking of your, your life and your really incredible achievements, so you're a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, uh, which is, well, an extremely high privilege in the UK. Uh, some of the best engineers are part of the Royal Academy, and you also have a CBE. You're a commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire, and just by that title, they don't just give them out to anyone, as you can imagine. Uh, so tell us about the process. Uh, when did you get your CBE, and, and how did you get it? Um, so uh, the CBE was uh, an entire surprise to me. It really, really was. In fact, my my wife opened the letter and said to me, "Is this is this some sort of joke?" 
Well, so, so, well it, it sounds authentic, but honestly, I don't know. Um, so I, I was already a fellow at the Royal Academy of Engineering um, at the time. I had been for several years. And the citation said, for services to engineering. So I figured, ah, it's probably a nomination from the Royal Academy. So I wrote a thank you email to the chief executive there. Uh, and I said, uh, dear Philip, um, I'm not sure who in your organization is so good at writing creative citations, <laughs> but please pass on my sincere thanks to them. And he replied saying, dear Chris, in the immortal phrase, I can neither confirm nor deny, but I am super pleased to hear that you got it. Well done. <laughs> That's amazing. Please put me in touch with whoever did that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Um, Chris, Chris, uh, you, you studied at Cambridge University uh yes. all, almost 40 years ago uh and uh maybe it, it's it is one of the most competitive universities all over the world uh so uh, also i'm so curious uh, uh what was it like uh studying at cambridge as visually impaired person uh for 40 years ago uh and uh and and how how was your experience um I, I i think that they they had had a small number of uh visually impaired people go through the university at the time but it was certainly not um a normal occurrence so most people that i interacted with i was the first vision impaired student that they dealt with so we were sort of um learning as we went along uh, and interestingly, some of the lecturers um, were willing to share their own lecture notes with me. So they would give me copies of their notes, um, which I could then enlarge using my closed circuit television. But many of them were too embarrassed about the quality of their own notes, because this was in the days when lecturers still used to write their notes on the on the blackboard, and you know, literally as they went, they would they would be they would be chalking up on the on the blackboard. Um, so what I did was I found uh, a couple of students from the year above me who were known for being very methodical and, and photocopied their notes from the previous year because the lecturers were the same, lectures were the same year in, year out. And this was great because it meant that I could actually sit in the lecture listening to the lecturer rather than frantically scribbling away, which is what everybody else was trying to do just to keep up. So I think in some senses it gave me a bit of an advantage. Um, yeah. They did... Uh, they did enlarge my exam papers for me. So uh, I could still, as I say, I could still read enough um, if, 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 the, if the print was large enough. So I had actually had two desks in the exam hall, one for me and one for my paper, because my paper was the size of an entire desktop. Uh, and that sort of worked, except that for one exam in my second year, I sat down and I started reading this paper and I was doing theoretical physics in the second year. And, I'm, and this was the maths paper for physicists. And I got to the first question, couldn't even understand the question, let alone how I was going to fix it, how I was going to answer it. Second question, same again, couldn't understand the question. Got to the bottom of the first page and I had not understood a single question. And I was in a cold sweat by then. I was thinking, what has happened? I must have been sleeping through a whole series of lectures here. Then eventually I looked back at the top of the paper and they'd, ex they'd um they'd expanded the wrong paper. This was a paper for second year mathematicians, not for second year physicists. <laughs> so they had to send me away and then do an emergency enlargement to a different paper, which I could then sit on my own in the afternoon. That's so funny. And that's so true, by the way, about the large paper. That's exactly what it was like for me back in school. There was always two tables, yeah. <laughs> one for the enlarged paper. And ah, yeah. it's... It, I personally cannot imagine though, and, and this is, I mean, this is something we take for granted now as visually impaired people. I guess it's like the young generation of visually impaired people with voiceover and yes. you know, high contrast mode. I mean, with my condition at least, I have LCA, which is also her hereditary. I cannot imagine sort of going through university without digital tools. You know, I cannot imagine just because I, I wouldn't be able to read off um, large print and I've never learned braille because I've become so used to technology. No, that. yeah, yeah. It, and also, Jean Marc, uh, it, it, you know, uh, these this digital technologies are really new. Maybe uh, uh, 15 years ago, uh, I was preparing 
uh, myself for the university entrance exam. Uh, however, at that time, uh, there were there weren't uh, too many digital uh, opportunities uh, to uh, to to read the uh, questions and all preparations, tests, etc. So I had to find someone else to read all these questions, etc. And then then I made all my preparations uh, during the uh, university entrance exam preparation uh, period. So uh, I believe these digital technologies has, cha has changed our lives, especially visually impaired people's lives, uh, really. Oh, for sure. But Kershat, you're lucky because you got someone to kind of read it to you. But yeah. and for me, this is a bit of a personal story. So I, I studied at Imperial Civil Engineering. And they don't really expect to see a visually impaired guy doing civil engineering. I mean, I was the first visually impaired civil engineer they had. And I'll always remember, it's like, well, how do you explain, you know, structural drawings to someone that's visually impaired? You can read a question, you know what I mean? But what technology was ever designed to, you know, AutoCAD, for instance, it's such a visual process. So it's almost like, okay, sure, technology has helped in certain ways, but it still isn't perfect yet. And I really want to see more sort of advances, at least in engineering. Uh, to help visually impaired people in the field. But anyway, that's just... Yeah. Right. Um, on to the next question, I guess. Cause... Yeah, maybe, maybe after university life, uh, we can talk about your career journey. Uh, so uh, could you talk us uh, through your career journey? Uh, yes. So um, the company that I co-founded, Metaswitch, is a communications technology business. Um, we started out selling um, software to um, some of the big players in the uh, in the computer industry in the 80s. Um, and then we moved on to selling appliances to uh, telecom, the big telecoms players like AT&T, British Telecom, Deutsche Telekom, all these sorts of people. We were providing them with uh, voice switching technology at the time when voice went over from being uh, the previous generation to becoming voice over IP and all the sort of technologies that we all take for granted now, like, um, I guess, Zoom and, and, and Skype and WhatsApp and all these technologies which are just um, running voice communication over, over a, a data packet backbone. Um, when we started, everything was, was analog and, and we were a part of that transition. Um, that I was chief technology officer at that business for a long time. Um, we self-funded that business. It was um, always profitable for day ones from day one. So, unlike most startups these days, we didn't take any venture capital um, until the business was about twenty-five years old, I think, where wow. um, we got um, we had a significant secondary investment from two very big players in the in the space, um, Sequoia Capital, who are possibly the world's premier venture capital fund, uh, and from Francisco Partners, who are a very large private equity business. So they both put a significant amount of money into the business, which was really for two reasons. One was, by that time, we had restructured the business as an employee benefit trust. So all, all the profits um, of the company were paid into this trust, and its sole purpose was to distribute those profits um, to all employees. So we figured that if we, so, so the, the employee benefit trust owned the company. So if we sold a big slice of the business, then we would be able to distribute um, the proceeds of that sale to the, all the employees. And that was a life-changing event for, for many of the employees. So my PA, for example, was able to pay off the mortgage on her on her house. Um, and she was you know very substantially down the down the, the ranking list in terms of the amount of money that she received. But for many employees, it was it was a very significant thing. So that was great. Um, the other thing it meant was if we had um, a tier one venture capital firm involved in the business, then they would be able to open doors that we couldn't open ourselves. And that indeed turned out to be the case. And they've been, they've been very good and very patient uh, investors. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, we recently uh, just about a month ago, uh, there was an announcement from Microsoft that they had reached an agreement to acquire MetaSwitch. That's a mere 
39 years after we founded the business. Um, so yeah. it's a long, long journey, uh, but it's a, I think it's a good outcome um, for the business. Uh, the technology will be, will be deployed widely um, by Microsoft and the, um, the employees um, will, I think, um, uh, by and large, enjoy the opportunity that Microsoft will, will bring them. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, everybody, again, got more liquidity, got more um, proceeds out of that sale. That's great. Interesting, actually, um, uh, you, you asked me to think about an unusual fact about myself. Um, uh, an unusual fact is that uh, back in 1988, I think it was, Microsoft nearly acquired us back in 1988. And my unusual fact is that uh, I had to um, cut short a meeting with Bill Gates so that I could actually go and water ski across the English Channel, which I'd already committed to doing the next day. <laughs> wow, okay. I was not expecting that interesting fact. Most, <laughs> most people go, I, I, you know, I, I enjoy music or something. <laughs> I, was not, <laughs> I was not expecting you to say that you had to cut a meeting short with Bill uh, Gates <laughs> to, to go water yeah. skiing. But that, that's, uh, that's Chris Mares, everyone. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> uh, it reminds me of another story, actually, at the same time. Um, uh, we were walking, uh, we, were, we were just um, move, uh, in two buildings in, in Enfield, North London at the time. And I was walking with Bill Gates down, uh, down along Enfield High Street. And I um, thought, ah, I'm walking next to the youngest self-made billionaire in the history of the world. At the time, uh, he was 32. And I was only 31. So I thought, but that's okay because I'm a year younger than him, so I've got time to catch up. Of course, <laughs> year goes by, I get a year older, and the gap gets bigger. <laughs> I was not expecting you to say that. I'm still kind of lost for words. So that's, I mean, that's incredible. Also, you kind of stole my question from me because I was going to hint. I was going to like, by the way, I heard MetaSwitch was acquired by a little-known company. I think yeah. they're called Microsoft. Yeah. So, so yeah. I mean, that's incredible. I mean, just going back to, to sort of MetaSwitch and and the growth of the company. I mean, I think it's it's well, it's amazing the fact that the company was able to support its own self from its profits for what you said, 25 years before any capital had to be injected. Um, how, you know, what was that journey like? And did your visual impairment ever play a part uh, in the growth of the company? Or did you just sort of get on, get on with it and then and, and try to sort of cope? I'm curious. Um, I was very, very fortunate, actually, because my um, sight deteriorated at about the same speed as I progressed up through the organization. So when when I first joined, I could just see enough with some with some uh, enhancements, I could use a computer screen uh, to do programming. Uh, but then my site deteriorated to the point when I could no longer do that. But by then, I was already managing a team of engineers. So it became very easy at that stage for the company to justify paying for me to have um, an assistant who would help me with reading documents and so on. So um, just very fortunate to already be in a senior enough position that the economics of providing me with an assistant um, were really quite straightforward to justify. Um, and, you know, the co-founders of the business were always brilliant in, in terms of supporting me. Everybody is very, very respectful. And I, um, you know, I, I can't think of a single occasion in my, in my working life where people have been, have been, um, disrespectful of my side and it's been a joy to work with many of those people hmm. that's always good to hear it's, it's always nice when people you know empathize with um the special features that come with visual impairment i guess i'll say um yeah it's all about the people if you're in an organization that's the, the all the visually impaired people out there i mean we know this at we walk at imperial as well uh, if you find the right team and if you if people support you you can do absolutely any job you want to because as long as as long as you're capable and you're competent and as long as people are conscious about your, your impairment, then you should definitely just go for it. You know, you should, uh, you, like you, I've, I've yet to find someone that's just genuinely not accepting of visual impairment. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah that's so, so when I left um, uh, MetaSwitch, I sort of stepped back from MetaSwitch in 2012. And uh, that's when I started doing my angel investing. And I got um, very heavily involved with, an organization called Entrepreneur First, um, mm. which is a very, which is, a, we, we're a talent investor. So what we do is we uh, go out and find people who we believe could have a great impact on the world through entrepreneurship if they just 
knew how to be an entrepreneur, if they had a framework, if they had a co-founder, uh, and if they had um, uh, mentors uh, a, a, and a mechanism through which they could go out and ra raise money. So that's what we do. We uh, we run the operation in six different countries around the world, and we put two cohorts through the program every year, 100 people in a cohort, uh, and uh, we help them to found businesses. And typically, um, you know, out of the London cohort each year, there'll maybe be 10 or a dozen businesses that, that get funded. And um, uh, in that in that uh, job, I, uh, I, I work for them two days a week. Uh, I get to meet huge numbers of uh, entrepreneurs and people who work uh, at Entrepreneur First as well. And again, all those people are, you know, fantastically uh, respectful of uh, my site difficulties, and you know, almost to the extent that it, that sometimes I just people just forget that I'm actually I'm actually blind. You know, it's just it's just not an issue. Uh, by the way, Chris, um, uh, you, you mentioned about your angel investment uh, uh, experience as well. So uh, is there any specific domain that you have invested so far? or uh, so? Uh, and also, uh, how many uh, people, how many organizations have you invested as well? Okay. So uh, I have done just over 100 um, angel investments, which is more than I had intended to do. I mean, it's a if you're doing angel investing seriously, then you should certainly have a diverse portfolio. So I think, you know, I'd set out expecting to do about 40 or so investments, but in the last eight years, I've done just over 100. Uh, and the I mean, you do it assuming that many of those businesses will go bust. That is the nature of very early stage investing. It's very high risk, but yes. returns on the ones that, that, that work well. Um, so of those 105 or so investments that I've done, I think I've had nine positive exits. And by a positive exit, I mean, uh, I got more money back than I put in, sometimes very substantially more. Uh, and I've had 16 failures. Uh, there's probably a fair few, probably another dozen or so that really probably ought to be put out of their misery. Uh, but that still means that there is a lot of, you know, there's another 60 or so companies in the portfolio that I'm hoping will, in the forms of time, uh, have some good returns. I like to invest in technology businesses. I like them to be, to be something relatively deep in the technology because I think that's a strong um, uh, aspect of, of defensibility of the business. Um, so most of them are... B2B businesses, business to business, rather than business to consumer. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, most of them using AI or machine learning. Uh, mm -hmm. Increasingly, actually, um, some in the intersection of life sciences, that's biology, intersection of biology with, um, with artificial intelligence, which I think is a huge area for um, disruption um, and, and progress over the next five, 10 years in terms of drug discovery, uh, in terms of new materials, um, and lots of things at the moment we just don't think are possible, will in the next 10 years, I think, be solved by a combination of um, computational biology uh, and machine learning. Mm. Yeah, Metag is absolutely huge now. I mean, that's it's... Also, also, also uh, you know, angel investment is not just a giving the money you know, mentorship, uh, being mentorship is more important than uh, the providing uh, finance, financial uh, support. Uh, and uh, I believe all these entrepreneurs are really lucky uh, because they have uh, such a great uh, angel investor. We, we all have listened to your journey uh, and your success. Uh, so uh, they would be so happy uh, uh, because of your uh, uh, angel investment uh, uh, process. Well, that's very kind of you to say so. I think um, sometimes uh, I can be a little bit blunt. Um, <laughs> uh, they all tell me, and uh, I think most of the time they believe this, that, that, uh, that straight talking, honest feedback is what's going to help them to develop. And most of them are very, 
very appreciative of the of the feedback, which make, makes my job much easier. But you're no, no. right that doing angel investing um, as a passive sort of activity is not really where the interest comes. The interest comes in working closely with the people. And I'm on the board of about, I think I'm on the board of about eight or nine different um, early stage startups. And that, it's that that gets me out of bed in the morning, working with these um, super bright people on technologies, which I didn't even know existed a few years ago. Mm, for sure, that's amazing. Now, leading up to something even more amazing, uh, and actually a question which I've, um, I've been curious in for a while now. So you did a 3,600 mile tandem journey across the US and for a very, very noble cause. Tell us about that. And um, these basically your exciting stories about the journey, sort of an insight. What's it like tandeming across the US as someone that's visually impaired and the cause okay. especially? Okay, so, so um, this was in 2017 and that was the year when I turned 60. And I suppose I was having a small late life crisis um, and wanted to do something to convince myself that I still was reasonably um, fit. And in 2012, I had ridden from Land's End to John O'Groats, which is 1,000 miles. Um, uh, and we'd done that in 10 days, and we'd done 100 miles a day for 10 days. So that, that had been pretty grueling. Um, but I thought, right, what am I going to do at the age of 60? Uh, if I ride 60 miles each day for 60 consecutive days, then I can call that my 60 by 60 at 60. And I liked the sort of numerical symmetry of that, of that uh, sort of tagline, 60 by 60 at 60. So that's how I started. And then I just needed to find a journey that was 3,600 miles long. Um, and uh, within about half an hour of Googling, I discovered this route across America from the Pacific coast in um, Astoria, Oregon, uh, across to Portsmouth in New Hampshire, and it's 3,653 miles, which for me, that's close enough. So we, I then needed to do two things. I needed to um, decide on a cause, and it was always going to be something to do with uh, uh, helping with sight loss. Uh, it's the obvious cause for me to, um, to focus on. Um, and I also needed to find um, some people to do the ride with me. Uh, so the cause, uh, what I decided to do was uh, help with people suffering from cataracts in the developing world. This is one of the most effective medical interventions that there is. Um, someone who is blind from cataracts can be cured by a um, $40 in, uh, intervention uh, to basically replace the lenses of their eyes. It's an amazingly cost-effective um, intervention um, if done in, in the developing world. And much, much more expensive to do cataract operations um, in the US or in the UK. But um, there are groups of very talented um, surgeons who do these operations very cost effectively in the developing world. So I thought, um, if I can raise enough for each mile that I ride to cure someone of sight loss by a cataract operation, that will also be a great way to go out and raise money. You know, going out with this ask to say people, you, all you need to do is sponsor me for one mile, that's only $40, and that is going to restore someone's sight. Yeah. That seems like a pretty compelling um, ask. And indeed, it turned out to be so. And so we were able to raise uh, enough money to cure someone's sight. In fact, we did more than that. I think we got to almost 5,000 people's um, sight restored from that journey. Uh, so one, of the, uh, one of the things that happened towards the end of the journey, actually, when we knew... I think we'd raised about 140,000 pounds at the time. And James, who was my co-rider on the tandem, he said, well, Chris, you've raised this 140,000 pounds. He said, just imagine when we get to the Atlantic coast, if some guy comes up to you and says, well done, Chris, if you ride back to, if you ride back to the Pacific coast, I'll give you another 140,000. What would you do? And I thought about this for a bit. And then I said, I know exactly what I'd do, James. I'd get my own checkbook out and I'd write a check for £140,000 myself and forget about the ride. Uh, uh, I wow. mean, it's a, great, it's a great thing to have done. But uh, I think um, Oscar Wilde said about a classic novel, Oscar Wilde said, a classic novel is a book that everybody wants to have read, but nobody wants to read. 
and I feel rather the same way about riding across America. I'm so glad I've done it, but I'm certainly not going to do it again. <laughs> That's incredible. Honestly, yeah. it's it just sound. I mean, the cause, amazing, uh, and just the the sheer distance. I mean, again, it's one of those things that has me lost for words, and something which I hope that. You know, anyone out there that's thinking of doing something similar to really challenge yourself because anyone could do it. I mean, a lot of people, to visually impaired people, I, I know this is somewhat naive, but a lot of people go, oh, you're visually impaired. Can you even ride the bike? And then here you are tandeming across such a, a vast expanse. So yeah, yeah. Any- I mean, I was, I was, I was slight, I was very lucky actually, because I had um, uh, on the front of the tandem, I had uh, one guy who rode with me the first half. And then I, uh, he couldn't. He couldn't spare the time to come all the way across. But uh, the guy he was sharing a, a flat with, and they're both PhD students, at Edinburgh. The guy he was sharing a flat with volunteered to do the other half. So uh, my front rider was less than half my age and only covering half the distance. They were both really strong cyclists. So I said to them, well, "Look, you're less than half my age. You're only covering half the distance. So you just need to work twice as hard." And that's what they did. And they, were, they were absolute Trojans. Have, yeah. you ever, have you ever tandem rode with Chris Lewis? Because Chris always talks about his tandem. Uh, well, no, we haven't actually. We keep, mate, we keep, in fact, Chris and I were doing a podcast together uh, last week, um, uh, uh, Metro Sport, I think. Um, uh, and um, we've always talked about um, wanting to get out on, on our tandems together, but. Uh, I don't see that happening anytime soon because with COVID-19, um, I'm not actually going out of my tandem at all at the moment. Uh, Chris, uh, I believe you have uh, many things in your mind to do. Uh, and also after 39 years, uh, uh, MetaSwitch has just acquired by the Microsoft. So uh, could, could you tell us uh, what do you have planned going forward? Uh, yeah, so I am becoming very passionate about um, climate mitigation. I think we have a, a major, major, major crisis on our hands um, uh, as a population. And um, I think there are many people who have completely understood this, but there are also many people who haven't. Uh, and uh, I would like um, to dedicate a reasonably significant, possibly full-time part of my uh, career for the next few years to, to doing something in that space. And specifically, I am chairman um, of a business called the Future Forest Company. And the Future Forest Company is all about acquiring significant pieces of land in Scotland and using that land to sequester carbon uh, to take CO2 out of the atmosphere. And we can do that through a variety of mechanisms. The most obvious one is by planting trees, and we will plant a lot of trees. Um, we can also do it by improving the carbon sequestration in the soil. We can do it through some more novel techniques, um, such as enhanced weathering, which is a way of using powdered rock to actually take carbon out of the atmosphere and we can do it with biochar. So there are many different techniques that we can use. And our objective is to acquire tens of thousands of hectares um, of uh, land in Scotland and use that land to actually uh, make a small difference to, to climate change. And by the way, to everyone watching this podcast, so when I asked Chris during the preparation, I was like, Chris, what, what do you have for the future? Do you have anything interesting? Um, and he was like, yeah, I've got something. And I had no idea what you were going to say. So throughout the entire podcast, I was thinking to myself, what area is Chris going to innovate next? And I, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, is this going to be another bike ride? I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. And now you're telling us you're going to solve climate change. So I, I am not going to solve climate change, but I'm going to make a, a small contribution. I'm sure I would say a, a pretty substantial difference. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, everyone, I think this has been an absolutely incredible episode. Um, Chris Mares, really, I mean, an incredible history. It's been it's seriously an honor um, having you on here and um, just getting a bit more of an insight into what you do. I'm absolutely fascinated. I'm inspired. You know, seriously, the sky is the limit. And I hope all our viewers at home also see that, look, visual impairment, yep, 
sure it's, it's it's a thing obviously it's it's a life-changing thing but if you really put your mind to it you can you can achieve more than a lot of people you can genuinely do some amazing things so thank you very very much for listening um stay tuned for next for well our bi-weekly episodes now so um we'll have an episode for you in two weeks time um and thanks again take care everyone and thanks again chris it's been great having you thank you guys it's been